When I was in college, I knew a guy who had lots of great stuff. Great stuff. Huge TV, uh, good furniture. What I really envied was his audio gear. He had his whole like recording studio set up uh, in one room of his apartment. Uh, you know, good computer, top of the line, had a uh, big soundboard interface. I knew all the things. There was no way on earth he could ever afford them. And uh, I was a bit jealous. But as I got to know him, and as uh, time carried on and carried on and carried on, I uh, discovered that he had taken on a mountain of debt. The reason a student could afford all this stuff was that he couldn't. It was buy now, pay later. This was back in, of what, 1999, 2000, something like that, that I met the guy. He finished paying it off last year. But in that first year, in that time that I met him, <coughs> someone who didn't know him, or know his situation, know his real finances, they might have described him as blessed. He was one of those guys that has everything. And that's what it was like in Jesus' time, too. Uh, there were those who had the appearance of having it all. I mean, uh, we talked about looking around that hill, and there would have been some affluent people. There would have been those uh, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the ones who were respected in their community, the ones who had status. They were business people that had money, and probably they would have been near the front. And then, you know, farther down in the back, the people who knew that, you know, they're not worthy to hang out with the, the upper crust kind of people. And these people had the appearance of having health and wealth and status and prosperity. These were blessed people. The blessed people were the ones that were to be emulated. They were the ones that people wanted to be like so that they could be blessed too. That's how life worked. And that's why after Jesus of Nazareth you know, had this trail of followers that had been developed after... Uh, teaching out in uh, the synagogues in the countryside. He, he had healed people. He had done miracles. Like, uh, you know, he fed 5,000 plus people with a few fish and some bread until they were bursting at the guts. These people followed along. He sat them down on the side of the mountain and he just blew their minds. And this whole year, we are joining them. I think that a lot of the same, yes, I think that a lot of the same attitudes, that uh, the, the ideas that people had back then are the same attitudes and ideas that people have now about faith and about life. And Jesus still wants to show us a new way, a different way, a better way, a way to live life like the life that we were created to live. Uh, a life that's in harmony with each other and, and in, in harmony with him citizens of a different kingdom. And this different kingdom has different rules and laws and different ways that success gets measured. The message that Jesus gave to them turned their world upside down. It turned faith right side up and it is so thick, so rich, there's so much meat in it that five weeks into this series, we are halfway through the introduction. It's vital though, I think it's vital that we get this because it's not something that he's just saying to, to get their attention and blow through what he really wants to talk about. This is something that is the foundation of everything that's coming. He's building something. This is kind of like the first bracket that shapes and connects everything that's coming in between. And so before we dig in today, I am going to get a little bit theoretical. I'm gonna talk a bit about structure and how Jewish people thought and taught and argued in that time and in that place. One of the reasons, one of the many reasons that the New Testament writings that, uh, that got collected in here and got saved and got honored by the early Jewish and early Christian community was that they showed a mastery of how to argue, how to, how to present a case, how to, how to teach, basically. And they were inspired by God, but they were also given a weight because they proved their wisdom in how to think and how to apply God's law. 
And, and I want you to know this stuff, not just because it's interesting. I find it interesting, and honestly, a lot of people don't, and that's okay. But because God's word is so rich and so thick and so deep, that when you study it for yourselves during the week, and that is something that I encourage you to do if you don't have your own Bible, there's Bibles for free at the back kicking around. You can go on, uh, on your phone or your tablet. You go to the YouVersion Bible app. You can get all sorts of Bibles. So much Bible. There's all sorts of Bible just at your fingertips. It's amazing to me. There are places in this world that people are desperate for Scripture, desperate for the Bible. They have to smuggle a copy of the Bible in and then share it with the whole church. They're desperate for it. We have a million ways to get the Bible into our hands. We get it for nothing and we ignore it. The written word of God, it's, it's so simple and it's complicated. Well, not, it's not complicated, it's just, it's deep. It's like that movie Shrek. You remember Shrek? This is kind of a dated pop culture reference, but Don, he's, he tells Donkey, you know, ogres are like onions because they have layers. Well, the Bible is like onions or ogres. It's like that. It has layers. Can God speak to you through scripture without knowing this stuff? Yes, absolutely he can. And he does. Do you need to know all this other stuff to be saved, to have a right relationship with God? You do not. You absolutely do not. But there are a lot of confusing little tidbits and things that people ignore or they get wrong because they don't know what to look for. Now, it was considered truly masterful to be able to connect and weave different threads in, in a speech or a discourse or a letter together in different ways to show a deeper meaning in light of each of it and how it ties together different facets of this thing. Like, okay, I don't knit. It does. It's, that might surprise you, but I don't knit. Uh, I think it is an impressive skill, Vanessa knits. Uh, anyone who knits impresses me. That said, even I can look at something without knowing how it was made and see the difference between something simple and something masterful in terms of a scarf or a sweater or whatever someone happens to knit. Both of them would keep you warm, but there is something more about the expertly crafted one. For those who do knit, though, there's another standard. They see something different. They see stitches and patterns and, and how it uh, all comes together shows the, the skill that it takes. They might even know something about the person that made this item by the way they knit, or the yarn that they use, or the patterns that are in play in it. They might even want to learn to knit like that person if they were really impressed. And this is kind of like that. At this point in his introduction, people are starting to become aware, if they weren't already, that they are listening to a master communicator. By the time he finished these beatitudes, these blessings, these eight lines, those Pharisees, those teachers of the law, those people in the front row would have been sitting there like, taught this guy? Where did he come from? What did he, where did he learn? It's part of the reason why later on we hear this people saying, isn't this guy just a carpenter's son? Wh who did he study under? Because he blew their minds. I want to show you something. Uh, one of the big things, uh, typical pattern in Jewish instruction is it, it loops back on itself. It works in, in kind of a an X or a bracket. They call that chiasm. And it's after the Greek letter chi, which is an X, basically. Chiasm is X. Basically means things start out here, and these things match. And then these things, and then these things, and then these things. And it comes together and comes back out, and they all weave together. And this uh, is more than just something that's interesting. When you start to look for it, it jumps out all over the place. You see it all through the Sermon on the Mount. And what it does is it tells you the thing that's happening here applies to the thing that's happening here. They're not independent of each other. This is going to get more interesting in a second. So if we go through the uh, Beatitudes, we've got the poor in spirit. Theirs is what? Anybody remember? There's the kingdom of heaven. And then we said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 
Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Last week we said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Jesus carries on. And he says, uh, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are peacemakers. For they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what we see there is coming through, got a big clue when he repeats at the end, kingdom of heaven. He's tying everything together there. And there are ways to connect. There are ways that uh, people break them up. We tend to uh, look at these in terms of each individual thing. Each thing being independent. And they are. All of these things are true. And that's a good way to look at it. It's not the only way. What, uh, what he's seeing here is he's turning a corner. Something different happens right here. Up in here, we've got the things that are going on inside. The things that are inside your heart. You are poor in spirit. You are mourning. You are meek. You are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And in light of that, because of that, these are the external things. You are merciful. You are pure in heart. You are peacemakers. You are persecuted. Last week, we heard a guy say, you got to be hungry. you got to want it. I think the quote that uh, he gave was something along the lines of, you have to be willing to do the things today that others won't do so that you can have the things tomorrow so that others won't have. And at that point, Jesus is turning the corner. Have things that are internal, things that are external. And the last thing that we tie all these things together is that these are the hallmarks of a person that is connected with God. And these are the blessings that are attached to it. And as he's doing this, as he's saying this, I know this is kind of weird to you. I don't know how much you're connecting with this, but the people in the audience would have been sitting up and going, oh my goodness, their minds are blown. So he's turned a corner here. It's not bad advice to say, you got to do the things today that others won't do, so you can have the things tomorrow that others won't have. In fact, it would have been a very familiar kind of saying, kind of thought to anyone who was sitting on that hill listening to Jesus, but he turned it on its head. He said, you're not blessed if you hunger for money or fame or status or power, because you'll never have enough. Those who are hungry for a right relationship with God above all else, they will have their hunger satisfied. See, it's there that he pivots and says, blessed are the merciful. So he's going from, from what's going inside to the action, what's going on outside. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. First, here is why that is a weird Statement. I'm just going to bring this in now. Here's why that is a statement they would have thought was odd. Mercy was absolutely a virtue that they knew about. And it was considered a beautiful thing to be merciful. But it was one of those things that's best admired in someone else. Right? Uh, everyone loves to see a good person being good. You know, unless it's making you feel guilty about them being good. But uh, we talked about Mother Teresa a while back, and how Christ-like she was. She was so good, Mother Teresa was. And we all applauded her. The world applauded her. Yes, we love Mother Teresa. But 
But not many people, not many Christians, ran out to be like Mother Teresa. She lived in poverty. All her goodness and mercy didn't translate into blessings. To the best of my knowledge, Mother Teresa did not even own one Mercedes, let alone the four that it would take to move her into that kind of blessed status. They would have said that mercy is good, very virtuous, but not if you want to get ahead in life. Anyone who knows money knows that the real way to get ahead is not to make and sell things. It's to be in the money business. Right? It's uh, investing, trading. You know, best of all is if it's with somebody else's money. Right? That's how banks and loan sharks and you know, payday loan places, they rake it in. They lend people money, and then they expect them to pay back more money than they lent. So they get free money at the end. There's no product, there's no anything. It's just, you here, take this money. When you give it back, give me more money. Great business to be in. It's basic economics. Blessed are the ones who build a financial empire. Yeah? Everyone knows you do not build a financial empire by not collecting the money that you're owed. Then you have less than you started with instead of more. You know, you send out Benny, and you send out Vito, and you make them an offer they can't refuse. The merciful would not have been blessed, because you don't get rich by forgiving debts. Mercy is about not taking what you're owed. So does that hold up in terms of blessing? Like, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, so they'll be showing mercy. What's he talking about? Is he talking about karma? Communism? Uh, everyone just gives and takes willy-nilly. You lend money, you borrow money. No one gets paid back. The person who wins is the one who can borrow the most money and pay the least back. That's blessed, right? I don't think that's what he was saying. See, later in his gospel, Matthew records Jesus telling a story that I think explains it pretty well. Uh, it's in chapter 18. This is, if we go about 80% of the Bible, this is the first book in the New Testament. This is the book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew. Matthew is Jesus' story. And uh, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 18. So if you're with me, we're about this far through. If you're not, that's okay, because I'm going to read it. So we're starting at uh, verse 23, and Jesus is telling this story. Jesus tells these stories all the time. He loves to tell stories, and these are stories that had stuff that they would have understood. Common people would have been familiar with everything he's mentioning, but he expected them to dig for a deeper meaning. And he's been talking about forgiveness, and he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with the servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors, one of the servants that owed him money, was brought, who owed him millions of dollars. This is a very generous king, apparently. He thinks his servant can have a million dollars and pay him back. And we're not going to go there, but okay. It says the servant couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. The man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me and I will pay it all. And his master was filled with pity for him. And he released him and forgave his debt. So this millions of dollars debt, he doesn't even like just give him more time to pay it off. He says, you know what, I know you can't pay this back. Just don't, don't even pretend, just go out. Don't worry about it, I'll eat the loss. He says, when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat, and he demanded payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me, and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. And the king called in the man that he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. 
Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive the brothers and si- your brothers and sisters from your heart. I'm going to blow through a couple of things and then get back. Two thoughts right there. Mercy is available. Mercy comes to those who ask. And if we do not live in light of the mercy that we've been given, it can't be taken away. We move on. See, the Romans had this system. It was called debtor's prison. If you owed money and you didn't just default or declare bankruptcy, the person that you owed, they could decide that enough was enough and they would put you in jail. You could ask for mercy, but you had no legal right to it. You, you could ask, but it depended on whether they wanted to make arrangements with you, give you more time, forgive the debt, or if they just wanted their money. Now, how do you pay back money from jail, you might ask? Well, there are a few ways. Your family could redeem you. They could, uh, they could pay your debt, or someone could buy your debt from your, your creditor and, and take that on as an investment. Uh, the Romans, they could put you to work, building roads, whatever, and give your wages to the person that you owed money to until it was paid back, or they could just decide, I don't want to wait for it. I'm, uh, I'm not going to deal with any of that stuff. Sell all his stuff. Sell him. Sell his family into slavery. That money, give it to me. Pay back the debt. Pay back the interest. Roman government gets to keep whatever's left. Looking around that hill, a blessed person would usually have been one that was pretty skilled at getting that to happen. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? That same word that he's talking about, that same word for mercy, that is what Jesus is saying when he says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. What Jesus is trying to get them to think about is not the appearance of wealth, uh, the, what the world sees. He's trying to get them to think about net worth. Do you, do you know what I mean when I say net worth? Uh, on a small scale, anyone who has ever like, lent money to someone, one of your friends, one of your family, and then you're frustrated because you watched them buy stupid stuff instead of paying back the money that they owed you, you get it. Like last month, you lent them money for rent, and then they got their paycheck, and now they're buying a new stereo, and you still haven't seen your money. They're spending money they don't really have. They're spending your money. Our society is terrible. Terrible for that. Excluding mortgages. Mortgages are considered to be an investment. This is consumer debt, they call it. The average Canadian owes the banks or credit card companies about $9,000. That means some people owe less. Some people owe a lot more. It's like that time my buddy Sean, he invited me out for a drink and he took, uh, took me to a restaurant that was at a department store because all his other credit cards were maxed out. But he could put, his, he could put these drinks on his Bay card, his Hudson's Bay card. He had all these things that he bought. He looked, this is a different friend, by the way, than the first friend. But he looked and he acted wealthy, but he owed someone else more money than he had, a lot more. You read stories in the news of like celebrities who are apparently wealthy people, but they're actually destitute because of gambling debts, or uh, people with a ton of income, but all of it is going out this alimony like six ex-wives. Net worth is a pretty simple concept. It's the value of what you have minus the debt that you owe. So pop quiz, who is wealthier? The person who makes $30,000 a year and is debt-free or the person who makes $100,000 a year, but they're servicing a $500,000 debt. I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands. I think that one should be pretty obvious. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. There's a net worth issue that these people just don't get. Like, I, I, I have talked to people personally that literally did not understand that credit card debt is real. Like, the, the, when they pull out this piece of plastic to pay for something, they're not getting somebody else to pay for it. They're using their own future money. 
Or better yet, maybe you've heard these horror stories in the news of kids playing uh, you know, mobile games uh, on their phone or computer or whatever, and uh, racking up thousands of dollars in microtransactions. Like, sometimes tens of thousands. They hit this button saying, yes, of course I want to buy a lollipop hammer. Uh, sure, refill those gems that I need to play. I will pay ten dollars for that. Then the parents get the bill. Believe it or not, this happens with adults, too. Child, adult, game, credit card, they owe this debt. They didn't even realize what they were doing to cause it. And it doesn't matter that they didn't read the fine print. We owe what we owe. That's what Jesus is saying. You all are getting bent out of shape about what people owe you. You don't even realize that you have this unpaid debt. You have this appearance of wealth, but you have negative net worth. These unmerciful people, they demand their rights. They demand to get what they're owed. That small amount that puts them ahead of the next guy, they neglect. In the background, there's a debt so great as to be unpayable. They come at the guy next to them for that $1,000 and ignore the million dollars that they owe. Faith, for the people on that hill, was transactional. You know what I mean by that? Uh, it, was, it was tit for tat, uh, quid pro quo, give and get. It was like a God's this vending machine. If they did something wrong, if they did something that offended God, if they sinned, what they had to do, uh, they thought they would go make a sacrifice at the temple and bippity boppity boo, everything's even Stephen. They paid for it, it's done. Like God wanted their ram or goat or bird or they, he wanted some bread or something. They thought it was about the wallet, not the heart. Just a bit after he gets done with the Sermon on the Mount, mercy comes up again in Matthew. I'm just going to show this up on the screen. It says, well, Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house. Many tax collectors and sinners came and eat with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Who goes to a doctor anyway? It's points that we're all sick. Anyway, he says, go out and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. And he wasn't making that up right, right there, the I desire mercy, not sacrifice. These Pharisees would have heard this, and like I said, gone back to the Old Testament. In this illustration, the opposite of mercy was sacrifice. He says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. It's a quote from Hosea 6.6, 6, where God accuses the people that their love is, he says, like the dew on the grass, it's here, it's gone, it evaporates. He said, I don't want your stuff, I want a relationship with you. Don't be the guy that only shows up when you need something. Don't have the arrogance to act like you're doing me a favor when you show up at all. He says, what I want is for your hearts to look like my heart. Because if you understood how much you owe, you'd stop acting like you had it all. It's not a coincidence that Jesus rounds that corner from, from you know, 40 days in the wilderness, hungry for right, being in this right relationship with God. And those people being you know, ready to leave the all-you-can-eat buffet, satisfied into those who are merciful, being shown mercy. It's not a coincidence. The person who is hungry for a right relationship with God, they understand their own failings. They're, they're not trying to justify themselves by comparing themselves to being, you know, I'm, I'm I don't owe you as much as this other guy. They're not trying to buy the relationship with God because they know that they can't afford it. When you live in that truth, when you live in that reality, you don't look at other people like they're less than you. No matter what, you don't. You don't think that they owe you. You don't think the world owes you. You certainly don't think that God owes you anything. When you realize that all you have, all you are, it comes from God. You realize you're living life with his credit card. When you start acting like it's yours, like go back to that paying the rent, buying the stereo kind of image. Like think about how God feels. Mercy 
comes from a heart that understands its own failings. Mercy comes from a heart that doesn't seek to justify itself. Mercy comes from a heart that is hungry for God's mercy. So I'm rounding this up. I, just, I want to be clear. Mercy does not mean being a doormat. It doesn't. Mercy means forgiving the wrong that is done to you, but it doesn't mean ignoring the fault in their action. Right? God is a God of mercy. He's also a God of justice, and he is both at the same time. For the merciful, the way justice comes down is different because we have a different perspective of who owes what to who. Book of James, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, James tells his people, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What that means is to stop thinking about life in terms of what you're owed and live in the reality of the grace that you've been given. As soon as it becomes about how much you, know, you can do and how much you have, you put yourself on a scale that cannot be evened out. But when you live with a scale where you've been shown mercy, where what you owe has been taken away, it's become a gift from God that none should boast. Every little thing that comes down on the other side is a blessing. So how is your net worth? Do you get it? Mercy is expressed by those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they feel the magnitude of their own unrighteousness. Mercy is expressed by those who are meek, because they leave the judgment to God. Mercy is expressed by those who mourn because they sympathize with the broken. Mercy is expressed by those who are poor in spirit because they don't feel like they have the status, the right to judge. Show mercy. Live mercy in your life and in your relationships. If you don't have enough of your own, use God's credit card for that because it's got no limit. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy.